you are aware, the focus today is on thalassemia. The 8th of May is celebrated as the International Thalassemia Day. And the slogan this year is, be aware, <clears throat> share, care. So keeping the slogan in mind at SRL Med Gurukul, we decided to have a session on thalassemia. And we have our experts with us today who would be sharing the experiences in diagnostics and also the clinical implications. If we look at the burden of thalassemia, many of you would have worked in blood banks, you would understand it better. So if we look at the burden of thalassemia in India itself, we know that we have the world's largest population of children with thalassemia major. This amounts to about 1 to 1.5 lakhs. And yet, despite the best efforts put in by the government, by NGOs, by medical organizations such as ours, 10 to 15,000 children are born every year in India with thalassemia major. With this background, recently we have also introduced Lentia's index in our CBC reports. The objective was this, to detect silent carriers, to triage out cases that require further investigations. So this has increased our workload. We are getting more queries than we were. We have to explain it to people. But if we can detect thalassemia trait, it would be worth all the effort that has been put in. So I will now invite our first speaker, Dr. Arvita Roy. Dr. Arpita heads hematology at the Gurgaon Reference Lab. She also heads quality and compliances in SRA. She has close to 20 years of experience. And in addition to her expertise in hematopathology, coagulation, flow cytometry, she is also an expert in quality assurance, ISO 15189 trained, uh, NABN, and a CAP assessor. And in recent times, we have seen Arpita is evolving into an educator, always willing to share her knowledge and expertise with others. I will now invite Arpita to start her talk on hemoglobinopathy, a comparison of new age screening tools, where she will be comparing HPLC and capillary electrophoresis. Dr. Arpita. Thank you, Dr. Abha, for the kind introduction. Uh, so uh, uh, we know that we are uh, the International Thalassemia Day was, of course, on 8th. And so we put up this, uh, uh, this session today uh, just to bring forward our experiences on uh, HPLC as, and now on capillary electrophoresis on, as a screening tool for uh, detecting the hemoglobinopathies. So I'll just prop up my presentation. Is the screen visible? Perfect, ma'am. Okay, okay. Yes. So, uh, just to start with it, so these are the objectives what we will carry forward in the session today. We will try and understand, like Dr. Abba just told us, the burden that we have of thalassemias and hemoglobinopathies in the global market as well as in the Indian scenario. How big is the problem and how big, uh, how uh, the rate at which it is increasing and how very important it is to pick up these silent carriers and uh, bring them to a diagnosis. Uh, to, uh, how how important is it in this uh, scenario? We will understand a little bit, of course, around the basic hemoglobin comp composition, the pathophysiology and introduction of the classification of hemoglobinopathies. We will talk about the lab workup uh, and talk about these two screening tools that are uh, kind of the gold standard as of now as screening uh, techniques. We will compare these two technologies. So technology-wise, uh, Apple to Apple will compare HPLC and capillary. 
and uh, show you our experiences. Now, since Tapillary had come here uh, first uh, time in SRL uh, at Gurgaon Reference Lab, so we were fortunate enough to be validating it for the first time. I mean, verifying the technique for the first time in SRL platform. Uh, so I will be sharing my experiences around that and show you how the validation statistics has come out there. And of course, the most interesting part will be the case-based discussions followed by some take-homes from there. So, uh, so this was International Thalassemia Day. Uh, we, on 8th, we, SRL and the Fortis, our flagship hospital went red, uh, just as an indicator of how important it is for uh, thalassemia, how big the problem is, and how important it is to diagnose at the earliest. So this is the market expanse. So if I talk about the global hemoglobinol market today, it is and compare it between 2022 to 2030. So this is how 10.37% market growth. So this is the burden and of course the market growth that is, and this is uh, 7.45 billion to 18.10 billion going forward, US dollars. And Another indication of the global market, this thing around, you can see between, a comparison between 21 and 28 on the sickle cell disease, alpha thalassemias and beta thalassemia. So how big the problem is, we can all understand. Now it is estimated that the thalassemia affects around 4.4 per 10,000 live births globally. And uh, believe it or not, we have 40 million thalassemia carriers present in India. Major factors leading to the high prevalence, of course, is the lack of awareness, unmet needs related to the treatment of the sickle cell, and lack of a permanent cure. Of course, the PMT and everything, uh, the uh, transplant is, of course, there. So according to a report published by the American Society of Hematology, more than 95% of the children born with thalassemias come from low and middle-income middle countries. So the developing countries have uh, carry a huge burden of these. And being recessively autosomal uh, inherited an inheritance from the parents, this creates a serious health problem leading to mild to severe mortality and morbidity amongst the Indian population and among the global population. So, and why in India it is important is the, because of the intense and the varied ethnic backgrounds that we have in the Indian population and, uh, and the mixture and amalgamation of the population's movement of the populations from one side of the geography of an Indian uh, uh, country from one side of the geography to the other and mixing and uh, marriages, consensus marriages and all these bring in this as a big uh, problem in India today. Again, to just have a look on how the burden looks. So this is a worldwide incidence of beta thalassemia. India, we are at 5%. That's a quite significant number of 5%. And this is what we have on sickle cells. Uh, so in sickle cell, you see that uh, India is very, very darkly colored in the sickle cell. And we are in a big range newborns born with sickle cell is a huge problem here also. The, another slide showing the estimated annual affected birth of children with beta thalassemias. So again, in India, we have around, this is the annual birth rate for with beta thalassemias, and it is around 20,420. That is also a big number that we are carrying in our population. Now, just to give you a little insight on, of course, this is something that we all are aware. So the hemoglobin uh, molecule made up of tetramers, made up of two pairs of globins, alpha and beta are the common variants. And the normal hemoglobin has two alpha and two beta. And of course, gamma and delta variants are there. Uh, so if, we, if I look at a newborn child, and if you see on the graph on the lower right-hand side, so this is showing how from the weeks of conceptions, to the birth and then post birth, what are the percentages of the, the various kinds of hemoglobin? So weeks in, in, the, uh, in the antenatal period, these are hemoglobin, GOVR1, GOVR2, Portland 1. These are the prominent uh, hemoglobins in the ch child's fetus's body. At birth, it is 
predominantly 80% hemoglobin F and some part of hemoglobin A2, that uh, hemoglobin adult that comes up, that is hemoglobin A. Hemoglobin A2 arrives in a child, in the newborn, absolutely newborn child. We don't have an A2 there. It comes at around two to three months of age. So this is how the structure is in a normal uh, uh, being and how the, there is a transformation of the hemoglobin types from newborn to adult. Now, if I want to, if we want to just classify hemoglobinopathies, the major two classification areas are a quantitative versus a qualitative uh, classification. So if it's a quantitative abnormality, we call that as thalassemia. And the quantitative abnormality can be in the alpha chain or can be in the beta chain genes. So it will be defined by imbalances of the alpha beta ratios. And of course, normal adult hemoglobin will not be formed enough depending upon how many genes are missing. We'll see in the uh, next slide how the severity increases. But this is, uh, remember, thalassemia is a quantitative abnormality of the globin chains. And the second part is the variance. And this is now a qualitative structural change in the hemoglobin. So there might be, so the variants like HBC, HBD, HBD-RAN, HBS, HBO, HBE, all that we hear of. This is qualitative defect. So there is a structural change in the protein in the in, in the genes of these uh, globin chain, and that leads to these hemoglobin variants. So when we talk about hemoglobinopathy, is divided up into thalassemias, that is the quantitative abnormality, and variants, that is the qualitative. Now, so this is the class of it. just to have a little better understanding of how the alpha thalassemias and beta thalassemias go on to. So for the alpha thalassemias, there are four genes. If I look at the box on the left-hand side, if all the four genes of alpha is a normal, so this is a normal or alpha, there will be a normal child, of course. If there are one gene missing, three genes are normal. There's a silent carrier. Two genes missing will be an alpha thalassemia trait. One gene left, it will be HBH. And of course, uh, BARTs or hydroxyphetins. So th these, these are the kind of things that come. Now for beta thalassemias also, it's a similar way. So when we talk about, if you see uh, beta zero, that means this, this is a beta chain uh, mutation that is eliminating or stopping all globin transcription at that end. And beta plus uh, is that the globin transcription or formation is decreased. So if you see the first one, if, if uh, my uh, the thal trait will come up if, Either one gene is normal, that is beta, and the other gene is beta plus, that is low uh, formation of the globin chain, or one normal beta and beta zero, that is no formation. This uh, elongates into a classification of beta thal trait. Of course, the clinical severity is silent, and this is the area where we look at these screening techniques, and uh, huge numbers are coming up with the antenatal panels. The gynees have also started recommending it as part of the first trimester screening only for the uh, for the all the pregnant ladies. Similarly, intermediate, it will be either B, uh, beta plus, beta plus, or beta plus, beta O. That will be a moderate severity anemia. Beta thal majors, we all know that beta chains are not being formed. It is severe. So now let, let us look at a flow chart that how do we go about it from a CBC? Of course, we know any hemoglobinopathy starts with the CBC. So what all we need is a full medical history, a family history of all the, uh, I mean, all the abnormal cases, a CBC and the erythrocyte indices, and of course, a peripheral blood examination. So this should be my baseline investigation. Now, if I start looking at a microcytic anemia, MCV less than 70 or 75 or 80, and an MCH low, I then look at, so I'm looking at a microcytic hypochromic anemia. I do a serum ferritin study. If my serum ferritin is less than 12, that, that is, it is less than uh, normal. Of course, it is indicating towards iron deficiency. So I go into iron supplements and repeat the test. If the ferritin, it's a microcytic hypochromic anemia, but my iron status is absolutely normal. Ferritin is fine. Of course, we go into HPLC or capillary electrophoresis or any other kind of hemoglobin screening technique. And then depending upon the A2 levels, the fetal levels and the adult levels, 
we can have various kind of uh, uh, presumptive diagnosis. Remember the word very important is presumptive. All these are screening tests. The only diagnostic confirmatory test is DNA analysis. And on the right hand side here, I've just tried to show you how RDW is also an indicator along with the RBC, indi uh, RBC indices. If I'm dealing with a microcytic hypochromic anemia and my RDW is elevated, it is more indicative towards an iron deficiency because there is anisocytosis. So I do a ferritin and take it up from there. If microcytic hypochromic anemia with normal uh, RDW is more indicative towards the hemoglobin. So these are the two things. And like Dr. Abba just mentioned, Menzer index, of course, depends upon, so in a thalassemic patients, all of us are aware, this is microcytic hypochromic anemia with erythrocytosis is what we usually see. So, and this index comes out as a calculated parameter from the RBC indices, indicating, uh, indicating a requirement to screen for hemoglobin. So now this is uh, the equipment that we had for ages in uh, Gurgaon Reference Lab. So we first installed the Bayrad Variant 2 Classic in 2007, followed by Variant 2, Bayrad Variant 2 in 2014. So we have almost 15 years of experience on this. Gold standard equipment, HPLC, and a uh, huge fan of HPLC all through. So we'll just try to show you some of the literature that we published from Gurgaon Reference Lab with our work on HPLC across the years. So here we had 2010, this was the first publication of 2,600 cases of the North Indian population giving out kind of presumptive reference ranges and percentages of various uh, de hemoglobinopathies detected at Gurgaon lab. So this was the thing that we saw as expected beta thalt rate was much more higher than the than the I mean the national average of four to five percent. We had at around eight point nine percent. But remember, this is kind of biased because these are all screened, uh, and there will be many that were microcytic hypochromic and advised to go in for HB variant. So these are clinically suspicious uh, cases. Beta thal intermedia major HBS a good numbers of 0.8 percent. HBD Punjab, Q India, HBE. So these are the major things that we found. We found a lot of double heterozygous interesting cases and I've just not penned down them here. Some other publications from our work here was again uh, where we picked up an HBH disease. I will just show you the pictures later on. And this was again an Indian population uh, publication. And then came capillaries. So December, 2021, uh, the capillary electrophoresis uh, came in. So initially, like I said, huge fan of HPLC and still uh, uh, still comparing between both of the techniques at multiple type, uh, times. Uh, but then this came initially was, uh, it was hard to, uh, hard to buy what the capillary uh, electrophoresis was claiming the benefits. But then I will show you how these five, uh, four, five months have gone and how experiences have changed from there. So now if I compare the technologies, so first bit is HPLC. If I compare the technologies, the throughput is somewhere like eight to nine samples per hour. Now HPLC on this BioRad equipment, each injection takes about seven minutes to complete the entire and go on to the next one. So I take out around eight to nine samples per hour. Of course, in HPLC, there is an HPLC column and there is a solid, there's a pump. Of course, this is fully automated, but this is how the technique looks inside the box. And this, this injection uh, runs through the HPLC column. There is a detector there and which is uh, the graph is populated onto the PC, onto the electron. When we come to ele uh, capillary electrophoresis, there is a migration that happens between the anode to the cathode, and there is a detector level there. There is a thermic bridge. So this is temperature control, and this goes through a very thin capillary, according to which it separates them. Look at the throughput, 45 samples per hour. And this is our experience on the bench. This is something that they claim and this is our experience from the bench is like 42 to 44, 45 per hour. 
So th this is one stark difference that comes. In. Then uh, now this instrument of capillary electrophoresis uh, here in uh, the Gurgaon lab, it has uh, a monitor like this. So that is the ease how we the color coded profiles are available. So if you see the blue ones, the blue ones are all normal. And the purple ones are all abnormal. You can appreciate the abnormal peaks that have come in there. Now, so at one go, my tech who is running the system, at one go on a big screen, he can see possibly 30 to 40 samples that have been run and just screen to and say, okay, all these are normal. These can all be uh, transferred to the LIS. Uh, the abnormal ones, he opens the graphs and sees that the settings and the migrations are right checks and then sends it forward through the clinics. So this is, uh, the software has this, this thing of having one visual uh, effect where I can see all normals and abnormals at this, all atypical profiles at one glance there, uh, raising an early alarm in the system. If there is anything that has gone wrong, it will not give the flag, it will not give the graph there and that needs to be repeated. So one go, one look and everything can be looked. Now sharing some, uh, I mean, art, some literature. So uh, now capillary electrophoresis is a new baby on the block in this area. HPLC has, of course, lots and lots of literature behind it. Uh, but the kind of uh, literature that is coming up with capillary now is quite healthy. And uh, it is uh, quite encouraging and showing the way forward also. So this is one uh, in the, uh, th that came up in uh, Clinica Chemica Acta. And this is a comparison of the CBR capillaris uh, electrophoresis and the Bayerite variant to the exact two things that we are comparing here. Now, so one thing that came up here and that came out in our internal uh, verifications also when we first were looking at the technology, that capillary electrophoresis was evaluated for carryover and it was seen that there is no carryover between an abnormal sample to a normal sample. And uh, so this was there in the publication. This is an experience that we have had during the verification actually. And so this is one thing good about this, there is no carryover. HPLC at one point of time, although there is no very significant carryover, but there were few cases during the years where the HBS, if I'm seeing an HBS homozygous case, there is a little carryover of 0.6%, 0.7% at times in the next graph of the patient. And sometimes we need to repeat that to take away that carryover. Now this is sharing what we exactly have in the, uh, in the at Gurgaon when we did the verification for the first time. You can see that the CVs obtained uh, so on intra-assay, inter-assay, so all my precision studies, the CVs were excellent, 0.02 the array of uh, three decimal points. The CV of A2 for intra-assay was 0 0.018 and 0 0.012 for inter-assay. Accuracy, the R-square values were excellent, 0 0.992. The BRIs were the same, the reference ranges reached were the same across both the technologies. Then what we did here in correlation was we did quite a significant number of samples on HPLC versus the capillary electrophoresis. So we did a method correlation in which the R-square value obtained was 0 0.9682, which was quite healthy. And also we did an interlab correlation, the electrophoresis versus electrophoresis. And the R-square as expected was 0 0.9922. The linearity was recovered. There was recovery across all the abnormal high samples that we did according to the company's claimed linearities. And as per literature, we checked on the carryovers. There was no carryover uh, detected. So this is the actual Gurgaon lab uh, verification report and their findings. Now comes the interesting part are the case study. So if I bring forth the case studies, let me let take you through first through a normal graph. For people who have not been uh, doing or seeing the graphs on a regular basis, I will start from the normal graph. So this is how my normal graph looks in hemoglobin and capillary electrophoresis. See, there is an adult peak and a clean A2 peak. That Those are the, all, all the peaks. 
at the most at times there will be an hbfp in the zf zone so these are the two things that looks in a, most of the normal people will have these things now similarly on hplc a normal uh, patient will look like this normal graph will look like this now how does it show so we i am having these small p2 p3 peaks a small unknown peak of 1.1% these are all insignificant peaks of course p2 p3 peaks in large more than 10% will be significant and interpreted differently but these are the routine normal peaks that we see across when i run a sample on an hplc now my takeaway from here is that there are clear cut separations and no unwanted peaks in the capillary electrophoresis the graph is easier to interpret of course when we are in the lab we are expertise to uh, there are expertise to interpret the graph but even when the graph is going to the clinician it is a neat graph that is going to the clinician now the next case now uh, what i have shown here most of you would be recognizing yes these are golf ball inclusions of a case of a live case that we had here and this is what we had on hplc so when we run this sample on hplc we see this kind of a graph now if i have golf ball inclusions i am looking possibly at an hbh so see the pre run peak so the first tall peak on hplc on the extreme left uh, is a quite significant tall peak but it is so close to the uh, i mean the y axis that it is not being quantified by the hplc equipment but i can definitely see a tall peak sitting there now so that is indicative either it's a alpha thal or an hbh sitting there possibly now possibly is the word because alpha thalassemias has to be confirmatory is only way to diagnose is a dna study but this is definitely an indicative that there is an alpha city now how does the same sample look on capillary and this is how it looks on capillary and what has it shown apart from the tall adult peak it has shown an hbh peak 3% if you see on the quantification at the left corner upstairs uh, it is hbh is 3% here and a low 0.9% hbh this is indicative of an alpha so now see that i can quantitate the capillary electrophoresis this is a published uh, finding and a published literature finding that it can quantitate hbh and hb parts to the extent of even 1% but in case of hplc all these sit in this tall peak here which cannot be quantitated but it is only indicated now another one is next case is a one year old child with a history of blood transfusion hemoglobin of 10 g a microcytic hyper moderate microcytic hyperchromic anemia and this is what my capillary electrophoresis graphs look like see there is an 1.2% hb bar sitting there so there is a small peak that has come up again this is screening test we just give the indication and ask for a dna study okay so again sharing the publication against the findings here and this publication clearly says that capillary electrophoresis can detect and quantify these variants even at concentrations less around 1% another thing is that when there is an high bilirubin sample many of these children might be jaundiced high bilirubin sample the bilirubin can cause a false elevation in the same area as hbh and hb bars in hplc but the bilirubin does not interfere with capillary electrophoresis okay so now this is the thal major i've just shown both the graphs in comparison a fetal of 97.1% versus a fetal of 92.1 of course the interpretation is same thal major we run a cbc and it is a severe microcytic anemia and uh, so this is this has so this is thal major this is thal trait again hplc on the left hand side capillary on the right hand side a2 5.5 versus 5.3 here so this is again microcytic anemia picture and uh, this is the a2 
Okay, so coming to this variant called HB Lipport. Now, again, on the left hand side is an HPLC graph, and on the right hand side is the capillary graph. Now, you see, and it is a documented finding that HB Lipport in HPLC co eludes in the A2 zone. So, in HPLC, we are seeing 12% A2. This co eludes in the A2 zone. This is actually HB Lipport sitting there. But we cannot separate and quantify. Capillary, on the other hand, Lepore separates out from A2. My normal A2 quantification is only 2.4%. And Lepore has separated out as 9.5%. Even if you see the peaks, A2 peak is at the extreme right, the last one. And just before that is a small but pointed Lepore peak that has come up in this zone. Again, data and publications are there that Lepore, this is a big advantage that capillary has to separate, quantify, and separately peek, up, peek out the Lepore. Okay, so uh, this is another area of concern, and uh, in some ways, <clears throat> capillary has really helped out in this, is that the S window. So when I have a sickle uh, cell anemia, and the burden we have seen in our earlier slides is quite high in Indian population, there's a sickle cell anemia, in HPLC, if there is a sickle cell, if you see the graph on the left, S window is 57.8 and A2 is 19.4. So there is a falsely elevated A2. I wouldn't say this is falsely elevated. What is co-eluting with A2 in HPLC is a glycated form of HBS. So that co-elutes and sits along with the A2. So that is why you cannot separately quantify what is the actual HbA2 level. So this is a disadvantage we have there. How capillary meets this is you can see the same thing here. HBS has turned out to be 73.2, whereas A2 is normal actually on the lower side at 1.7. So the, the glycated HBS all has come into this SP. So this, just to show you another case on this, the same thing. Here also you see an HBS of 34.8, but A2 is raised as 4.3. What is abnormal A2? So is this an double heterozygous or compound heterozygous HBS with beta thal? We could misdiagnose it that. So, but this is actually the glycated HBS, which is coming in the A2 region. So the same thing on uh, the, uh, on the capillary is an HBS clearly made out and A2 is absolutely normal there, 2.6%. So this is a big advantage we have. The next case, a patient of uh, microcytic, of course, 12.5 is the hemoglobin, but a definite microcytic picture there. And this is what my HPLC shows. There is a 28.8% A2, which is eluted at 3.64 minutes. Now, this is, what is this? This is possibly an HBE trait. Now, when we do it on CE, the HBE separates out totally. So this is another documented and published advantage that HBE separation from A2 is very clear cut in capillary as compared to HPLC. Uh, Again, HBD Punjab, not much here. So D zone is showing. I'm just showing you the graphs here. Okay. So this is another case in which there is a big A2 of 42.2%, but this has come at a retention time of 3.56. So I would say by experience on HPLC that this is HBD Iran. But of course, now we see that that expertise and experience is required to interpret it. But on capillary, the same thing has come in the D zone and clearly come out as D Iran at 200 elution. I will share you one case that I had. We had a major, major problem, and that is why I have called it as a Khatarna case here. So uh, we dealt, and this is very, very recently, we dealt with a patient with a six year old child actually with. Uh, moderate microcytic anemia. 9.8 is the hemoglobin. The clinician gave us the input that he is not responding to hematics. And he said that I had got an HPLC done at some other lab 
and sending you a repeat sample also please check the patient is the child is not responding to hematinix please check on capillary 2 now this is the hplc graph we run the sample on both the techniques because at that point of time i had both the techniques in hand with me so on the left hand side is the hplc graph the a2 levels is absolutely normal there are no abnormal peaks that had come up except for the adult peak or the hba peak is a little broader on the base uh, than normal that that is all the indication but it is looking like a, any external lab would have also given it out as a normal patient now when we did an capillary a 41.5% z uh, zone 11 came up now this came up separate from the adult peaks separated out and we couldn't understand what this was about of course zone 11 we usually show some rare beta chains that elute out in zone 11 so we reached out with this case to the capillary electrophoresis applications team and went on to uh, we also went on to discuss it with the global team that how hplc is like absolutely normal and there is this peak coming up molecular we sent the sample for molecular studies and the molecular study uh, confirmed that there was a rare beta chain mutation sitting in that sample so why did my hplc pick up so this was the uh, this was exactly what we discussed with the application team of the vendor that this this is compatible with a beta chain variant in zone 11 so they said there are of course and we picked up literature after that that there were no techniques that can differentiate all of these so capillary will miss some and hplc will miss some is what what the literature claims and what these people also claimed in this case the zone 11 has separated out on the capillary and possibly hplc being a different principle the it has co migrated with the adult fraction and is not visible separately and that is possibly why the hba peak is looking broader at the bottom because there is another abnormal variant sitting in the hba now this was very very dangerous easier explained here than to the angry clinician and we had a tough time uh, and finally we uh, we told him that the molecular is also showing a beta chain variant and uh, we are awaiting family studies on this chart now after the cases just to show you advantages disadvantages of both again to remember both are just screening techniques both should be so if i talk about hplc rapid sensitive specific definitely good precision and reproducibility has been there for ages as the gold standard as a screening platform so a broader literature available quantitative evaluation is good uh, very useful in pediatric age group as low value samples are well, so even 5 microns you can dilute it and put it onto the instrument complete automation graph as well as data can be interfaced disadvantages daily calibration required because there is a generation of factors that happens every day graph is complex so needs interpretative expertise there we have seen the cases there are many variants that co elute with hba2 and many variants that cannot be identified at similar rts like hbe hbd iran hbs hb leport low throughput definitely low throughput than the capillary glycosylated forms of these variants elute at different rts and they cannot be separate so like the one we saw in hbs so the glycated form is uh, is coming along with the hba2 and cannot be separated and these variant and rare uh, fractions co elute with hba cannot be measured the last one is the case we just discussed in the chat uh capillary advantages disadvantages again rapid sensitive fully automated no calibration required okay so no calibration required two levels of control there of course there are three levels available but two levels is the ba basic that we do uh, graphs cleaner not too many graphs easy to uh, interpret it has narrow resolution cap narrow capillary width high voltage and tight temperature control so the resolution of peaks are very good here we have seen the advantages of the co elute variants hbd uh, lepore coming up separately d iran hbe coming out separately we have seen the advantages in hbs cases 
high throughput with full automation graphs again can be transferred to lis and now all our reports are going along with the graphs hbh hb bots easily detected here no interference in hbs case disadvantages graphs uh, okay so one big disadvantage is till the time there is an adult peak uh, it is absolutely okay if there is a graph there is no adult peak then the sample needs to be run on an alternate method or hbs then another disadvantage is highly sensitive to change in ph and there might be times we see fast migration slow migration and we should know where our zones separate out in order to avoid any misinterpretation of the graphs cost may definitely be a bit high especially in cases of the sample loads so this is my last slide take homes both are screening techniques for population one has to be aware of the limitations and the problems associated with each types what all you can miss few on hplc you can miss few on capillary they are complementary techniques and both to be used routinely uh, both methods provide efficient so both are automated efficient methods but only differ in the logistics of identifying the variant hemoglobins especially in the absence of hba uh, hba2 the variant hemoglobins like s c e lepor separating out differently uh, this should be the preferred way reference lab setups with healthy sample load should have both the techniques in hand to be able to handle and interpret these complex cases and uh, since capillary like i said it's a new baby on the block but uh, the way the literature is growing and few advantages that we have showed today there is a prediction that this might also become along with hplc one of the major lines of screening in many clinical labs across confirmatory the important take home is only genetic testing and dr anoop will take you forward on this one these are some literature that we have taken the publications from this is my hemoglobin team although this was a diwali party uh, kind of a photograph but that's the hemoglobin team thank you so much thank you thank you dr arpita for a very lucid presentation i will now invite our next speaker dr anup rahul dr anup is a physician by training having done md medicine and then he went on to do his dm in medical genetics he is currently associate director medical genomics division at the srl goregaon reference lab He is also a consultant, clinical and cancer genetist at the Fortis Hospital in Mulund. So it's actually a privilege for us to have Dr. Anup with us today because he will now take us through the not only the molecular part but also uh, the clinical applications that are there for these screening tools and the diagnostic tests. Dr. Anup, could you please go ahead with your presentation? Uh, yeah thank you ma'am uh, am i audible yes yeah, yeah. uh thank you ma'am for a kind in introduction and uh, many thanks to arpita ma'am in particular for setting such a nice precedence for me to take it forward uh so just to start with uh, hemoglobinopathy is uh, one of the most common autosomal recessive disorders which is prevalent so before we uh, discuss uh, uh before we get into the molecular genetics aspects uh, of the hemoglobinopathies uh, just a brief uh, recap of how it works and what it is so body made up of uh, billions of cells each cell having a nucleus nucleus hosting all those chromosomes uh 23 pairs or total 46 uh, in all that is two dnas Uh, spread across uh, each set of chromosomes one set coming in from father another set coming in from mother and uh, in this uh, dna almost 1.5 to 2% and that is the functional or coding part that we say which hosts all the genes about 18 to 19000 genes and hbb is one of uh, those genes which codes for important components of the hemoglobin Uh, which we will, uh, which Ma'am had explained uh, previously in a slide. So the heme component, the globin components, it is a globin chains, alpha chains and beta globin chains which form the hemoglobin. 
So that is uh, at the molecular level. So to simplify things, how uh, molecular genetics works or how we look at the abnormalities or how I can simplify things for you. So uh, let's see those set of uh, 46 chromosomes in each nucleus. Let us compare it with the library of 46 books that we have. Right, day in and day out, we see these libraries. So we are aware of okay, what is the average thickness of these books. Uh, so we look at it through the microscope. So if you're looking at the number of chromosomes, 46 chromosomes, yeah, all good. So this is a low resolution genetic test that we look at. So going further, if I'm looking at each chromosome in detail, right? So are all pages there? Is the thickness okay? Or has there been reshuffling of some pages or interchange of some pages anywhere? Or there is some, some pages are missing or some pages are extra. So I'm looking at each book individually. So this is a mid resolution test. And going for the high resolution, so I am looking at whatever is typed inside the book. So abnormalities at this level can be at individual level, uh, can be at a single alphabet or single word or a sentence, paragraph or entire chapter, deleted, duplicated, rearranged, reshuffling and so on. So this is at the level of the nucleotide. So if we can compare chromosomes, the books, that is the library, all. So this we look at by karyotyping. Chromosome, we do a microarray. So this gives you copy number variations, deletions, duplications, and some microarrays also look at the single nucleotide polymorphisms. And then if you're looking at uh, the level of DNA, each nucleotide in those functional part of uh, the DNA, the genes, the exonic region, then that is what is type. So here we do the sequencing part. So having said that, so thalassemia, one of the most common uh, disorders worldwide. So ma'am has already covered about the epidemiology. What I'd like to focus here is look at this belt uh, across Africa and uh, Asia and Europe. So particular hemoglobinopathies are common in particular pockets. Uh, across uh, this uh, geographical region, right? Somewhere HBS is prevalent, HBC and so on. So this is the thalassemia hotspot, what we see. So there are certain uh, genes uh, we are talking of HBA and HBB. So in A, there is A1, A2. So since Ma'am had mentioned earlier, so there are two genes which code for the alpha chains and one gene which code for the hemoglobin beta chain. So the complex structure is like two beta chains and two alpha chains, which make up, and they, there is a region functional domain of the heme, which combines with oxygen, making it a complex structure, what we call as hemoglobin, which has a unique function of carrying oxygen and carbon dioxide to and fro. So there are two loci in chromosomes. So here book number 11 and book number 16, so there is a region or what we call clusters, which are coding for these genes. And there are numerous genes which are quite similar, which are hosted on this uh, chromosomes adjacent to each other. So here you can see uh, HBG2, HBG1, HBD and HBB. So this is the beta globin cluster, which is located on chromosome 11. And similarly, alpha globin gene cluster on chromosome 16, HBA2 and HBA1. Right, and these alpha and beta chains uh, in numerous ways, they combine and they give rise to various uh, combinations of uh, proteins that are detected on HPLC or uh, capillary electrophoresis, which are the screening, screening tests which help us to diagnose or uh, point out what abnormalities we may be looking at. So of relevance is here that throughout the fetal life, till up to say 12 months to 15 months of age, there is a transition of uh, the, uh, uh, the genes that uh, work or express the proteins which lead to the hemoglobin. So there is a change or shift in the pattern of hemoglobin, uh, hemoglobin what uh, we know. So uh, from fetal to adult, and there are certain genes which in sequence, they are getting expressed and as the age advances after birth, the previously expressed genes, they become repressed or they stop functioning. And later on the adult 
hemoglobin component it is uh, expressed by hbb gene and hb a gene so that is what usually happens and again so this is uh, quite important like uh, particularly if you are so hplc capillary electrophoresis are a very good screening test so again screening per se is important for couples who are planning pregnancy or who have come for uh, pre conception or pre marriage because carrier status is quite common in our country and it is a autosomal recessive disorder so if both partners are inheriting some mutation in the hbb gene so there is a 25% chance of having an affected child so and again there are regions in the world where you know consanguinity is there so same thing what we uh, saw earlier across different geographical locations there are various mutations which have been commonly reported from those pockets same thing for india and southeast asia if you can see at the uh, here ivs 125 then see this the and so on and same region if you see consanguinity is quite common so more so the rationale for doing best would be a pre conceptional or pre marriage screening of the couple but uh, once the screening is confirmed then molecular diagnosis becomes important because the same test capillary electrophoresis or hplc cannot be used for prenatal diagnosis in the child whether on a cvs sample or amnio uh, synthesis uh, fluid sample in that case molecular genetic test or hbb sequencing report is going to be important because it will help us to identify which pathogenic variant is present in either of the couple uh, either of the partner and then we have to look at those variants uh, in the uh, fetal sample and across the globe these are the common variants which have been re uh, reported about 8 to 12 of them and first 5 to 6 are the most common which make up to 90 to 95% of the chunk of samples which test positive on uh, say hplc or uh, capillary electrophoresis which are suspected for hemoglobinopathy particularly thalassemias right so, uh, so the common uh, uh, trend is if you have a patient who has screened positive for a hemoglobinopathy we test for those five to seven common mutations first because the chance of hitting uh, that mutation is up to 90 to 95% so it's better to go for a limited panel it will be cost effective as well if it is negative then we screen or we do the whole hbb gene sequencing again that's a small test it doesn't cost much about uh, 8 to 12000 uh, and the gene is also small so that is one more advantage uh, so if the smaller panel comes negative we go for whole hbb gene sequencing and across india various studies have shown the common mutations they are same what have been reported worldwide few of them uh, here uh, ivs 125 ivs so this is like intervening segments the region between the exon and intron so these are the codes that we use to uh, represent the mutations uh, in the genomic region right so the basic pathophysio i won't be going into the detail so pathophysiology in thalassemia is uh, the problem happens due to excess of alpha globin chains so right so if there is a mutation in beta globin chain so instead of two gene one gene is functioning so the amount or quantity of beta chain decreases proportionately to alpha chain and these alpha chains precipitate form uh, 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 sediments or you know uh, precipitates in the rbc membranes and they cause rbc uh, lysis so this this is the issue so if a patient has a a mutation in beta chain at the same time there is an alteration in the alpha globin chain where there is a either a deletion or duplication so this also governs the phenotype what is going to be manifested so this is what we call as modifier genes so there are many other um, genetic aspects what we call as modifiers we'll see in subsequent slides and same thing governs the entire phenotype right from like uh, there is a entity called as thalassemia intermedia so a patient having a homozygous uh, mutation or a pathogenic variant in hbb gene but yet few of them either they don't require blood transfusion or even if at all they require they manifest much later or the frequency may be very less so these are various criteria what uh, clinically they used to identify uh, such individuals and in them 
so variant may be pathogenic but there may be other genetic factors which influence the phenotype and the disease severity is mild and at the same time in other individuals the disease severity may be severe and even the complications of the uh, condition may be more over uh, than uh, rest of the uh, uh, patients or cohort of uh, thalassemia again this is cover uh, this is also governed by the underlying genetic abnormalities so hemoglobinopathy is what ma'am had covered earlier so beta 0 variants so if you have a mutation or a pathogenic variant in the hbb gene where this beta gene uh, is not being produced or it is the function is uh, totally uh, deficient so these are the ones what we represent as beta 0 and beta plus that some amount of uh, beta chains are being produced so particularly this beta is zero and some beta plus variants they are associated with severe phenotype and result in thal major when when they are present in homozygous or compound heterozygous states so two variants in h pathogenic variants in hbb gene and there may be a modifier which may lead to thalassemia intermedia so if there is a ameliorating genetic factor or any genetic influence which decreases the severity it also decreases the clinical severity of this disorder what we call as uh, ameliorating genetic factors and in some beta plus variants they have a mild phenotype and again clinical severity in both homozygous or compound heterozygous state with other beta 0 uh, and beta plus variants this may be variable so depending upon the rare variants if they are there so this can be confusing at times even at the genomic level if only limited like Uh, suppose in uh, we have done a hotspot panel and we have looked for just five common mutations we find one we don't find another and uh, clinical uh, on testing on uh, capillary electrophoresis and hplc is suggestive of uh, hemoglobinopathy so in such cases then sequencing hbb whole gene sequencing is recommended to clarify so the, there may be silent variants or rare variants which may uh, result in such a phenotype and then there are few uh, beta plus silent variants so again uh, this have a mild phenotype or in rare cases when they come uh, there is a compound head state uh, where there is a beta 0 uh, variant or a beta plus variant these uh, otherwise are silent uh, silent trait may manifest with a severe uh, uh, clinical phenotype and uh, interestingly the mild and silent pathogenic variants they are Uh, need to be suspected and uh, looked for uh, when your common mutation panel comes negative that is uh, of importance so the very good example is like in for any particular genetic disorder we always try to look okay what is the clinical picture what is the phenotype and what is the genetic uh, abnormality that has been found and so there is a correlation what we call as genotype phenotype and it becomes very important now since uh, thalassemia or say hemoglobinopathies is one of the most extensively studied genetic disorders lot much data is ava uh, available and th 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 this is where the concepts of uh, say uh, genetic modifiers even in thalassemia autosomal dominant uh, inheritance also has been noted so so th that these things are uh, really interesting to note so, though uh, few cases or rare instances but they have been uh, documented and it is all because of the genetic variability and uh, modi genetic modifier factors uh, which are important so sickle cell if a person is homozygous ss is uh, the most common uh, variant that happens at the sixth uh, nucleotide uh, uh, in the hbb gene so uh, amino acid sorry so If the person is homozygous so this is usually uh, they manifest with the disease and same thing if there is a compound head one sickle cell mutation with uh, say uh, another mutation which is uh, known to cause a pathogenic uh, thalassemia so again combination sickle beta thal so these are more severely affected and then there is something known as hbc so hbc traits uh they usually don't have uh, any clinical uh, you know complaints uh, phenotypically they may be normal even in compound uh, when uh, uh, compound head uh, sorry compound homozygous state bc they uh, may range from a milder phenotype 
two severe phenotypes. So there is a spectrum, but even in combination, HBS and HBC, uh, they may have a milder phenotype compared to where sickle cell mutation is homozygous. So the reason is individuals with this uh, compound heterozygous mutations, one for HBC and one another for HBS, they have a longer uh, red cell lifespan and again, higher HB concentration. And again, they have fewer vasoocclusive brain episodes that has been found in studies. So that is the reason where phenotype, uh, phenotype is milder compared to a homozygous um, uh, mutation. Right. So, and again, alpha thalassemia, uh, what we have seen, uh, it improves the red cell survival. So if there is a deletion of uh, alpha gene simultaneously with a beta thal uh, deletion, if it is there. So this decreases the excess amount of uh, alpha thalassemia proportionately, which otherwise would have been formed. And this decreases the hemolysis. So it again has an influence on the clinical phenotype. So if uh, So this acts as a modifier gene as well. So at times there may be a patient who has uh, say, uh, who is homozygous for uh, HBB uh, uh, mutation for beta thalassemia major, but at the same time, if there is a mutation in alpha thalassemia gene, which results in decreased production of this alpha thalassemia genes, this ameliorates uh, the clinical picture and this acts as a genetic modifier. Across uh, this genetic uh, gene cluster uh, uh, for HBB gene and alpha and beta, there are various uh, regions uh, which have been, uh, in studies they have shown that they have an influence uh, which act as a genetic modifier. So these may be located adjacent to the uh, loci which have been identified, which may be upstream, downstream, or in promoter region or they, that is, uh, they act in cis, or they are adjacent to the chromosome or the genomic loci, or they may act in trans, like uh, located elsewhere, like uh, transcription factor, GATA1, which is on X, uh, chromosome X, and uh, so on. So these are the factors which have uh, been documented to influence uh, the clinical picture uh, in uh, hemoglobinopathy. Once you're talking of uh, modifiers, uh, so, then grossly they are divided as primary, secondary, or tertiary. Primary are the ones which are located within the loci, what we had seen on uh, the two chromosomes, just adjacent to the gene cluster of alpha and beta genes. Secondary are the ones which uh, may be uh, adjacent or nearby, but uh, they alter the phenotype of uh, uh, these hemoglobinopathies, so like alpha chain uh, deletions, if it is there, which reduces the alpha chain. So the phenotype becomes mild. If alpha chain duplication is there simultaneously with a beta uh, chain mutation. So this will increase the number of uh, alpha chains in those patients in, uh, leading to increased precipitation of alpha chain and increased hemolysis. So more severe uh, disease per se. And then there are tertiary modifiers, uh, other genetic factors which have a bearing on the overall clinical picture, the treatment, the complications or susceptibility to uh, features like say iron overload, iron absorption. So even uh, they have a bearing on the treatment part as well. So these are the tertiary uh, modifiers, right? So five to 10% of beta thal homozygous patient with the same globin gene mutation and sickle cell anemia patients, they have shown the variable uh, pattern of clinical expression, uh, expression. So that is how the studies have shown. So most common are the co-inheritance of alpha thal uh, variants, which could be deletion duplication, elevated levels of, again, uh, fetal hemoglobin. This is also important. So uh, as in treatment, we uh, uh, try to induce uh, this HBF gene expression into producing more of fetal hemoglobin. So that's uh, the drug used hydroxyurea commonly for treatment of sickle cell disease, right? And then both directly reduce the globin chain imbalance by increasing uh, in one case, uh, depending upon whether there is a deletion or duplication in the alpha chain. And second, where you induce or increase the uh, HBF gene expression by increasing the fetal uh, hemoglobin component. So among the beta uh, thal hemozygotes, uh, the beta thal intermedia, they have showed higher prevalence of alpha globin gene deletions as compared to beta thal major. major. So this is one of uh, the modified genes which probably never gets investigated and should be kept in mind 
particularly in families where like uh, beta chain mutations have been known and at the same time uh, if there are cases where uh, fetal high drops have been documented so simultaneously alpha chain uh, uh, genetic testing also becomes more relevant more so in this uh, in such cases right so same thing triplicated alpha globin chain uh, exacerbates the phenotypic abnormality whether it is in homozygous or compound heterozygous form uh, and sickle cell disease patients uh, if they co-inherit uh, this alpha thal uh, they have uh, improved hemat hematological uh, indices with better uh, survival rates so particularly alpha thal uh, alpha thal gene deletions if are there the phenotype will be milder if there is a duplication the phenotype will be severe and then there are other loci which have a bearing uh, on the hbf levels the uh, gamma globin uh, promoter region the bcl uh, 11a and hbs l1 so these are the intergenic regions which act in trans so then uh, there are various uh, 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 yeah so various uh, levels of uh, the chain imbalances like the uh, non uh, alpha globin chain imbalances that happen at the primary level or secondary level and uh, then the complications so these are uh, what we uh, saw primary uh, secondary and tertiary uh, modifiers and how they act so particularly in such patients uh, the secondary level of disease complications also may be uh, relevant if there is a genetic predisposition so, this aspect becomes more important while managing the patients because uh, in certain families if there are siblings who are affected and uh, uh, at times uh, i have seen cases in sgpj lucknow where uh, uh, this uh, iron overload was higher in particular family compared to rest uh, of the patients or uh, the increased predisposition to gallstones where there is a mutation in ugt1a1 uh, motor region which helps in the conjugation uh, of the bilirubin and then there could be increased propensity to certain complications like bone diseases or cardiac diseases depending upon those uh, genotype so this comes in addition if you're talking of hemoglobinopathies one aspect is molecular diagnosis understanding the phenotype and if you're managing at the same time if there is another genetic predisposition which could have a bearing on the management and uh, to understand the complications which may be related right so yeah so co-inheritance of persistent uh, fetal hemoglobin at times may mask uh, the clinical picture so that becomes very relevant and then uh, certain rare so one rare variant i have quoted here which is known as the sardinian uh, thalassemia variant so in uh, cis uh, if it is present so this may again increase the fetal hemoglobin component so sometimes what happens uh, you get in, uh, increased say fetal hemoglobin component we look for the common variants which may be having a uh, link or which may be causing this and it turns out to be negative so in these situations in particular it becomes important to go in a stepwise manner to look for the common uh, variants first and if they are negative to go for hbb gene sequencing so in some instances this heterozygous beta thal again may lead to phenotype of thalassemia intermedia instead of asymptomatic carriers so uh, in uh, some uh, may refer this as autosomal dominant uh, thalassemia so here the reason may be like the variant as such is leading to a hyper stable hemoglobin so this this leads to precipitation of these beta chains uh, uh, within the rbc membrane and this uh, unassembled alpha globin chains also have its uh, additional effect leading to effective erythropoiesis so in few instances test with a heterozygous uh, mutation now since this is autosomal disease recessive disease one would expect two mutations to be there in on two uh, dnas like two sets of dnas coming in from one coming in from father and mother but such cases have been documented and this is something you, unusual and most hbb pathogenic variants lie in the third exon so this is to be noted so exon 3 is the largest in hbb gene uh, almost 60 to 70% of the pathogenic variants lie in exon 3 and most common is the 619 base pair deletion which uh, covers uh, the intervening segment 2 and exon 3 right 
Then a double heterozygosity for typical beta thal pathogenic variants and triple or quadruple. So this is like uh, the duplication or triplication if it occurs within the alpha globin chain. So it has a bearing on uh, the phenotype, right? And duplication of entire alpha globin gene cluster has been reported to cause thal intermediate and association with beta thalassemia carrier trait. So again, there have been case reports. Heterozygous person having uh, requiring uh, blood transfusions, though the frequency is less, phenotype is less severe, but the reason being associated or the patient also has a simultaneous duplication in alpha globin gene uh, cluster, which leads to pro production of excess alpha globin chains in proportion to the decreased beta globin chain, which then precipitate in the RBCs and cause hemolysis. So again, three factors that have been suggested for the type of pathogenic variants uh, in HBB gene. So one is uh, associated with HBB gene defect. That is, if there is a HBB, HBA gene defect that is involved, so in the, in the fetal hemoglobin production, uh, it is being modulated by sardinian variant or the common variant to uh, minus one five eight C two T. So this lies in the intervening uh, segment. Or genetic variants in trans located elsewhere, but having bearing on the function of the HBB gene. So, for such documentation, is there a mechanism studies are still trying to figure it out, but this has been strongly associated and seen in the studies. Like these two variants, uh, loci have a strong bearing on the phenotype uh, of the patient. And again, effect of this loci on transfusion-free survival probability and on age at which the patient started a regular transfusion that has been documented in studies. So sometimes it happens that patient has beta thalassemia trait, uh, but associated with that uh, hyperpigmentation uh, or uh, photosensitivity is there or uh, there is exposure uh, on exposure to sunlight uh, there is like uh, uh, ulceration of skin or irritation or there is hair loss so such unusual or thrombocytopenia associated uh, with uh, in a case of beta cell uh, beta thalassemia trait so these are certain conditions which may mimic a thalassemia, like a beta thalassemia carrier, but there could be another genetic disorder which is uh, actually there and may be uh, mistaken uh, for beta thalassemia trait. So, uh, xeroderma pigmentosum or trichothyodystrophy or then extinct thrombocytopenia with thalassemia. So, where thalassemia trait and thrombocytopenia both are common case. So, again, a rare less than a point. Uh, I'll say 0.5%, 0 0.3 to 0.5%, but needs to kept in mind if we have any additional findings. So what are the routine patterns? I think Arpita ma'am has uh, covered this very nicely. So anything unusual on HPLC or capillary electrophoresis should be confirmed by molecular diagnosis. Now, what are the indications for molecular diagnosis is particularly uh, once a couple is planning uh, conception or pregnancy is there, we want to do a prenatal diagnosis. That is one. Second, in infants, particularly because uh, the shift of expression of various uh, hemoglobin genes simultaneously happens, so happens from so like uh, shift from HBF to adult hemoglobin that happens. So that is the window where your uh, now, the capillary electrophoresis now gives much more good uh, results compared to HPLC clears most of the doubts, but still uh, for uh, or getting a confirmation over that molecular testing or genetic testing uh, will be advisable in those cases. So these are various uh, methods which are used for screening or diagnosis. So the best ones or the ones that are recommended uh, for screening are HPLC and uh, where available capillary electrophoresis both have their uh, pros and cons uh, which have been discussed earlier. When it comes to molecular diagnosis, uh, if uh, we have an indication or we know which uh, peak is there on say capillary electrophoresis or HPLC, based on that we can decide the testing. So the common uh, recommendation is to go for a panel which covers the common mutations first in HBB gene. Uh, 
otherwise uh, whole hbb gene sequencing uh, can be done so there are ways of doing it uh, the if you want to do hbb sequencing sanger sequencing is the method of choice right uh, if the differentials are there you want to simultaneously look for other conditions where pointers may be there for other genetic disorders in those cases definitely next generation sequencing so there are certain uh, pitfalls like which has been nicely discovered uh, discussed earlier so co-inheritance of alpha thalassemia if there is a, a double heterozygous uh, status uh, in the proband then associate like uh, additional there is a deletion or duplication of a alpha thalassemia gene then uh, so these situations uh, in these situations uh, your hplc reports or uh, uh, capillary electrophoresis reports can be confusing at times so in such cases particularly uh, hbb gene uh, test is advisable and particularly when uh, associated like silent variants are there so these are the ones where the phenotype will be very mild uh, but it will be consistent with uh, you know residual output of hemoglobin beta chains with normal rbc indices but this may still be important because if both the partners are say carrier of different variants we'll have to look at what could be the probable compound heterozygous status so whether it is sickle beta uh beta with c beta with e so these will have different interpretations because some compound heterozygous status may be completely normal which we can ignore in those situations prenatal diagnosis may not be required at all but cases where say, say uh, one partner is a carrier of sickle cell uh, variant and another partner is a beta thalassemia trait in such situation definitely prenatal uh, uh, diagnosis should be offered so the variant has to be uh, confirmed in the uh, both the partners so we know exactly what variants we want to see in the fetal sample either by cvs or by amniocentesis right so these are various factors uh, particularly genetic factors or other uh, factors which have uh, influence on uh, you know or which may interfere with a screening test so even the mutations at times uh, they uh, can be uh, they can lead to different phenotype or overla overlapping phenotypes say thalassemia intermedia or heterozygous variant with alpha thalassemia resulting in a uh, severe picture so on so testing in newborns uh, becomes uh, it's a uh, totally uh, uh, you know unique or different affair the reason being most of it is fetal hemoglobin 1 to 1% hb parts and remaining is is hba so the gene expression at this level uh, the, the it is undergoing transition right so your hplc or even capillary you know, electrophoresis may show these variants uh, which are there but if you uh, if you know like uh, for uh, even for uh, child with beta thalassemia major to manifest they usually manifest after say 9 uh, to 10 months between 1 year to 1 and 1/2 year that is when the clinical picture starts becoming uh, more obvious so if in those situations where like newborn screening uh, shows uh, uh, the screen comes positive or there is clinical suspicion parents being carriers for some reasons if prenatal diagnosis could not be done so in those cases for the baby it is advisable to uh, look at the screening test reports and also simultaneously then go for a genetic confirmation uh, the hbb gene test and there are a lot many algorithms uh, which have been published so keeping in mind and also looking at the differentials uh, say sideroblastic anemia or hbs inclusions that may be there at times or so sickling uh, test is there as an alternative if sickling test uh, comes positive uh, more so it becomes a reason like okay we know what uh, molecular abnormality in the hbb gene i am looking at so these are clues which are important and help to plan the further genetic testing with more accuracy so just to sum up uh, we have a uh, hplc or capillary electrophoresis report which shows suppose a normal pattern with or a hbh is there so then uh, we look at okay, what is the ethnicity is there consanguinity or is the 
call or say the proband coming from a geographical pocket where the prevalence of uh, the hemoglobin epithelium is high or a particular uh, say uh, genetic mutation is more prevalent in those regions so we look for those common uh, mutations first if it comes negative then we go for uh, sequencing accordingly so this is like for hbh we look for alpha globin then uh, if it is negative then uh, so for looking at deletions or duplications or copy number variations the test of choice is mlpa right and if we have abnormal pattern in hplc where there is an increased hba2 or there is a suspe uh, or we get uh, any other abnormal variants hbsc e so on so based on that then to whether to go for uh, the common uh, hotspot panel or uh, the hbb sequencing that becomes important so uh, for the 619 best pair deletion uh, mlp is a test of but yes if you do hbb gene sequencing on a sanger then uh, on cell electrophoresis or uh, uh, you can identify uh, the 619 best pair deletion uh, if it is there so that gives one advantage so then evaluation of relatives at risk in such families one is for early detection so primary manifestation of beta cell so early detection of anemia so which can help in uh, ameliorating or starting prompt treatment then getting uh, you know uh, this patients for monitoring and follow up and uh, particularly if some uh, couple or some individual is identified as trait then uh, they can be followed up of uh, in future for uh, say uh, once marriage is there we can counsel them to get a partner screen uh, by screening methods and if there is abnormal report then definitely uh, hbb gene test is advisable for both particularly in families where pathogenic variants uh, has been identified so it will be advisable like to do the genetic test in those cases uh, it is uh, a consanguineous marriage uh, or say a, a geographical pocket where a particular uh, hbb variant has been reported to be in a high prevalence for those cases and again prenatal diagnosis or say uh, pgd is advisable so what autosomal recessive uh, pattern of inheritance means like we have a pair of dna one coming from father and mother so in partners both if they have a mutation in this hbb gene right so it may be the same mutation in both different mutations what we call as compound heterozygous right in both the situations so the chance or the risk of having a affected child is about 25% so in, and 50% may be carrier this uh, again becomes important because they need to be followed up you have to counsel the parents that in future when these children uh, want to marry and uh, want to plan pregnancy that is when uh, this uh, report becomes very relevant and important and 25% children are normal so again uh, coming if there is a thalassemia woman who is planning pregnancy so there have been many uh, case reports per se where uh, management by a multidisciplinary team has shown to have a favorable outcome in such women uh, again a very good outcome in babies at, uh, as well but then timely diagnosis proper management uh, taking care of uh, the transfusions and all those things becomes very important so involvement of the obstetrician with the hematologist with the molecular geneticist with the lab team uh, all these things become very important and lot many uh, cases now uh, are there where uh, women with either major or intermediate they have had children the major issue in such group is hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism which is common and again uh, to point out the gonadal function is usually intact in such uh, uh, women and again uh, it becomes important that they undergo closely monitored stimulation therapy so again uh, this leads to a successful outcome in most of those cases right one thing i want to point out here is like particularly in those women with thalassemia intermedia who had never previously received a blood transfusion or who had received a minimal quantity of uh, blood again they are at risk of severe autoimmune anemia if at all blood transfusion is required during pregnancy so studies have shown this that this risk is there particularly in thalassemia intermedia women and we should be uh, careful 
So uh, prenatal testing and pre-implantation genetic testing, uh, once both pathogenic variants have been identified, you can offer prenatal diagnostic testing. So that can be done by chorionic villi sampling at uh, 10 completed weeks between 11 to 13, 14 weeks or by amniocentesis at 16 completed weeks of gestation. So provided that both the pathogenic variants have been identified, that is very important. It is always advisable. So uh, any couple planning pregnancy should have their HBB gene test done first. Otherwise, we are racing against time. The pregnancy is there. We don't know the mutations. We have to get the parents tested. Pregnancy is advancing. And then simultaneously, uh, you do AMU and then you look at uh, the variants and you try to correlate. So it can be difficult at times. Um, gestation is advanced. Then PCPNDT regulations are there. So all those things need to be kept in mind. And again, pre-implantation uh, genetic testing is being offered. So particularly with couples who, uh, who are carrier pathogenic variants, again, associated bad obstetric history or any other complications due to which such couple offer artificial reproductive technology, IVF. So embryo, uh, testing of the embryos can be done uh, by uh, trophoepidermal biopsy on day five. So that option is available for common uh, variants, of course. Uh, and particularly in those variants which have been, uh, so more, most important is pre-implantation genetic workup for the couple. So here the pathogenic variants in the uh, couple needs to be documented and identified. And again, in those cases uh, of high risk where, you know, couple are uh, known ca carriers or indeterminate risk where where one parent we know is carrying a pathogenic variant, but other parent, the report is not available, picture is not clear, or person is not available for testing. Or we know that a person is not available for testing, but the person belongs to a family where, uh, you know, uh, the population risk is high, or, you know, uh, not many members are there in that family who are affected with leukemia. So in such cases, then it can uh, be difficult. So testing becomes more, molecular testing in such situations become more important uh, to plan for say uh, prenatal diagnosis or pgd now one thing that's coming around the corner is non invasive prenatal testing so all of us are aware of non invasive uh, nipt tests that we do for common chromosomal aneuploidies so there are studies which have shown that uh, on the based on the same principle where you have cell free fetal dna circulating in the maternal blood you can pick up these variants and actually identify uh, whether the fetus is affected with, uh, uh, you know, uh, fetus is whether heterozygous or homozygous for particular uh, thalassemia or HBB gene uh, pathogenic variants. The catch point here is, uh, particularly in those cases, it becomes easier. Suppose a couple is uh, compound heterozygous, father is carrying a different mutation than the mother. You look for those paternal mutations in the a maternal uh, sample, if that is negative, it negates the need of invasive for the invasive testing because at most, you know, the child could be carrier and same can be tested later on rather than going for invasive testing in pregnancy then. So this is under, uh, this is uh, under event. Dr. Rahul, we are running a little short of yeah, time. Yeah, just last slide, ma'am, last slide. Okay. So okay. this is uh, uh, under evaluation and again, uh, studies are going on. This is not as informative as NIPT. But definitely, if the pathogenic variant in uh, father is known, this uh, negates the need for, uh, you know, uh, uh, invasive testing. So the advantages of NGS or Sanger uh, for, so it has higher sensitivity and specificity, even for rarer variants. Cost is uh, uh, prohibitive at times. Then it has shorter turnaround time, uh, maybe a few days. Comparable precision. So that is that. And in... Uh, in NGS, there is a limitation that gene rearrangements or larger deletions or duplications could be missed. So then you have to complement it with the MLPA. And again, single uh, G, uh, single cell uh, uh, testing, whole genome analysis by PGD and NIPD, uh, there are other options that are available. So this was one study which showed against conventional testing for alpha thalassemia on sequencing, the yield was much higher. They were able to detect all uh, thalassemia carriers as well as 
uh, the composite uh, alpha and beta thalassemia patients with no false positives. So there are many studies which have shown this. And just to uh, the list to point out, which I mentioned earlier, a lot many silent and mild variants have been documented. So these should be kept in mind when doing a test. So rational for genetic testing, HBB gene test. So higher sensitivity specificity and utility, particularly to confirm the carrier status, molecular confirmation of diagnosis and its utility in prenatal diagnosis, PGD, and particularly testing the neonates and confirmation of NBS. So advisable to go for common five mutations first. And if that is negative, then for the rarer variants. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rahul. Very comprehensive presentation. Questions can be put on the chat and we'll go over them together. Uh, the first question is regarding uh, low volume lab, Dr. Arpita. So what is preferable, HPLC or capillary? If you have about 15 samples per day. Uh, so capillary is expensive. Like I told you, capillary is definitely expensive. But uh, again, the capillary comes with different models. So there is a mini cap model, which has two capillaries in an instrument. There's an octa model, there's a tetra model, which comes with eight, 12 capillaries per, uh, so each. So when you talk about the capillary equipment, it's like if I have an octa machine, it is like eight machines working into one. So the two level of control goes into all the eight capillaries. Uh, every day, it becomes expensive. Uh, HPLC, on the other hand, has uh, will be a little cheaper with a small uh, load. The, in HPLC, I don't know what is the pricing around mini cap and all that because those are two capillary things. But HPLC does come with a D10 model also, uh, which uh, which can run on dual mode. It can run on an HPA1C mode as well as an A2 mode. So more flexible with that. The second question is regarding alpha thalassemia. Can alpha thal be detected on HPLC? Which modality is better? So I think we have discussed in detail in the presentation, alpha thalassemia we have seen in HPLC comes out in a pre-run peak kind of a thing in which it cannot be quantitated. Of course, this both are screening techniques for alpha thalassemias. Uh, molecular is the... Uh, the uh, uh, diagnostic module for that, the confirmatory module. But yes, uh, alpha thals uh, elute in various zones in capillary can be quantitated a little different uh, separately. HBH, HB BARTs, we have seen the advantages in the case we discussed. Right. Next question is regarding HPH. What is the range, normal range? What is the range for it? No, so usually if normally I, we shouldn't have an HPH in a normal person. So HPH is nothing but uh, three genes of alpha are missing in that person. That turns into an HPH uh, uh, on, the, on the sample. So usually we should not, a normal person with uh, all four alpha genes in place should not have an HPH. Many compliments come in the way of the speakers. Many are motivated to have capillary electrophoresis at their location. Uh, there is also a request for a session on mini cap serum protein electro, uh, electrophoresis. So we'll make a note of that and maybe we can do it in the future. Next question is about HPO Arab elute. Where will it elute in capillary? So HPO Arab elutes in the zone three in capillary along with an HBA2. Uh, so that is one thing in capillary, one of the few things in capillary that elute in the A2 zone. But when we have HBO Arabs, we usually have a concentration of 25, 30%, 40% in the heterozygous cases there. But that elutes in that zone three uh, A to small window there. Right. Uh, next question is for you, Dr. Anu. What are the test codes for DNA analysis for hemoglobinopathies in the SRN system? You're on mute. Yeah. So uh, this 2482 is the test code. I was just checking it. 
So 2482 is the test code uh, for the common mutations. And then there is a separate uh, HBB gene, whole gene sequencing. I'll need to check the test code for that as well. I'm just finding it. So I'll right. put it in the chat box. Yeah. 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 Uh, if, you, if you could put it in the WhatsApp group, that yes, will, please. you know, even those who have not been able to attend, they would know of it. So yes, that would be good. And I think we are done. Any more questions? Uh, anyone has any, uh, anything you would like to say? You could raise your hand. I just see compliments coming. Uh, next question is, are there any clues for alpha pal and CBC or any other lab test? Uh, see, alpha thalassemias also will uh, come and will depend again, like I said, whether it is a silent carrier, one gene uh, deletion, two gene deletion, three gene deletion, and so on. The clinical severity, of course, is uh, manifested as anemia only, mostly microcytic. And uh, again, these are screening tests, both of these things discussed today, or even in cellulose, electrophoresis, acetate, electrophoresis, all these are screening tests for alpha thals. Uh, DNA is the major this thing. All these presents as anemia of the different uh, intensity. Right. Of course, if I have a severe anemia sitting, suppose there's a child with four hemoglobin, uh, severe anemia sitting, my A2 levels are absolutely fine. A2 fetal levels, everything on uh, the HPLC or CE are absolutely fine. And child is not responding to hematinics uh, or the A2 levels is on the lower side. So alpha thalassemia is many times on HPLC and CE the A2 levels go on the lower side. So it will be 1.2, 1.1, 1.3 HbA2 with the severe anemia. Of course, we uh, at times, and I don't see any peak anywhere in the alpha zone. Uh, even then, these people are advised to just screen out a DNA study to understand that whether there is any alpha fancy. Right. So I think we've gone through the chat there are no more questions, so we'll end today's session. Thank you to both the speakers for very comprehensive presentations. And it was excellent because we went through screening to diagnostic tests and it gives us, uh, you know, we dealt with the topic in totality. And thank you to all the participants too who have listened in. If there are any more questions, you can always put it on our WhatsApp group. Anything that you think of later, you can put it on the WhatsApp group. Someone has also asked, will a recording be available? Yes, a recording is available. And I would request for us to give you details regarding that. Yes, ma'am. So uh, we will upload the recorded session on our uh, Med, Med Grukul uh, tab in SRL Learn on Zing Learn app. And otherwise, also, if anybody needs it, can directly mail it to me and I will share the link so that you can download the same on your system as well. But I will prefer that it remains on our platform and at your ease, you can go and access there. Right. right. So, recording is available on our platform for this session and also for all previous sessions. So, you can go over. It's a library now. You can go over the sessions. So with that, we'll conclude today's session then. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.